Location is dead. Um, I spent the past few years of my life working in a social and collaborative research group at IBM Research uh, about down the road, about 20 miles or so in San Jose. And if you run in the social computing circles, what you frequently hear is the mantra, location is dead, the world is flat, where you live no longer indicates how effectively I can work with you. You may be down the hall, you may be on the other side of the globe, it doesn't matter anymore. Now, I recently did this study uh, with some colleagues of mine. We had a lot of IBM meeting data, so what does that mean? We weren't looking or interested in who was meeting with who, but rather what location was meeting most with what other location. The data was fully anonymized. We only looked at time, number of participants, and where the meeting took place. So we had 20,000 meetings, just a small subset of all of the meetings that happened at IBM that included over 200,000 participants. And we were hoping to find some statistics about how many people usually go to meetings, how many people are in these meetings, um, where do they take place, is there a specific location that's really prone to meetings? What we found was a little bit different. So I'm gonna show you a visualization and just explain very briefly. So, all right, there we go. Um, we plotted this data, and what we found was that 60% of these meetings were global meetings, meaning they included participants from multiple locations, multiple countries, and they were usually uh, teleconferences. So the green dots indicate a meeting is happening at that location. Uh, we condensed all these meetings into one day, one canonical day. We discarded the date. And we found that, you know, if you look at this visualization real quick, at 2.45 p.m. on the East Coast, you know, there's a lot of meetings. And, and this is just, please keep in mind, a subset. Green means a global meeting. Yellow means a local meeting with people um, in the general vicinity of where you are. Now, let's fast forward to... Now, at 1.30 a.m. Eastern, there's still a lot of, there's still meetings going on. And at 7.30 a.m. Um, in Europe, we still have a lot of meetings. And what we increasingly found is everyone works according to East Coast time. Now, let me define what East Coast time is. So East Coast time starts at 5 a.m. It goes until 6 p.m. And then it starts up around 8 p.m. and goes till about 10 or 11 p.m. People, people don't really sleep anymore. They essentially work all the time. So now here we are, it's 10 p.m. in Europe. People in India, Asia, Japan, they're still meeting. Meetings are happening around the clock. Now, time zone used to be an indicator of location. It is not anymore. Now, this, uh, this just doesn't apply to work life. Now, news spreads very, very fast now. Um, Thank you to, thanks to social networking sites like Facebook or Twitter, I instantly know what's going on. Where something happens is no longer an indicator of how quickly information and word spreads about it. This is also the case, oh, okay. So now, did any of you all watch Jeopardy? Okay, a, f a few people are nodding. So there's this computer called Watson. Um, and Watson is an is a artificial intelligence computer system that answers questions posed in natural language. In other words, questions on Jeopardy. So Watson went on Jeopardy about a month ago and he competed against human, human um, participants and Watson did very well. And, and now that we've finished with Jeopardy, the thought is, well, why don't we take huge amounts of medical information that exist. Now for Jeopardy, Watson was loaded up with millions of pieces of structured and unstructured content, including the entire contents of Wikipedia, but why don't we put all of this medical data into Watson, and the thought is, if you get really sick, you no longer have to travel to a specialized clinic, you go to your local doctor, the doctor you've seen your entire life, down the street, and he or she will have access to the same amount of medical information that you know, would exist at any of these specialty clinics. You don't have to go anywhere. Your location no longer matters. 
This also happens in retail. If I need something, I log into my Amazon.com account, I click a button, and it shows up on my doorstep tomorrow. I don't care where the blender that I ordered, I don't care what warehouse it came from, if it came from the East Coast, the West Coast, I don't care where the electronics came from. All that I care about is it shows up on my doorstep the next day. Now, Fresh Direct, they often do this with groceries. Um, this is very popular in New York. You don't have to go to the grocery store. You just log in online, buy your groceries. They show up within a reasonable amount of time. So I made the case to you that location is dead. Now, so if location is dead, why did 380 million people check into Foursquare last year? Why is Groupon, a company that that markets local deals, why are they so hot and such a big deal right now? There's also a lot of startups in this space where if you go into a physical store, you can push coupons to your mobile phone. Or when you're in a physical store, you, know, you can scan barcodes. And why are people using these technologies? Um, well, long live location. <laughs> The, the truth is retail stores, physical retail stores, are not going away. Um, I did an ethnographic study recently because I was really interested in why people buy certain things online and why people buy certain things offline in physical stores. Sometimes people will do a blending of research online, buy offline. And yeah, we, we had a slew of very interesting findings from this study. And there's a, a whole science around shopping and why people buy um, the things they do in stores. Increasingly, there is very little brand loyalty now. People make a lot of split decisions when they're in the store. Now, some of the things we found was that frequently people really want to touch and feel and interact with what they're about to buy, because shopping is such a highly sensory experience. For other people, it's very social. You go shopping with your friends. Maybe you go shopping, you interact with the people in the store. You interact with people in line if you're at Starbucks. Um, whatever the reason is, there's many motivations for shopping um, in the physical world. Now. <laughs> This means that we're generating a lot of data. Um, I go shopping, I buy, I buy many different things, I check in, you know, all of this information is generated. Um, I show you this picture now because I absolutely guarantee you that if you go into Safeway, Safeway knows what your favorite cereal is, how often you buy that cereal, what other products you buy in conjunction with that cereal, and what store you buy that cereal at. You know, we're generating all of this information. Now, what does this mean to location-based services? Well, it means that not only does Safeway know all about you, so does your credit card company. Your credit card company knows your, all of your favorite retailers. And you know how, who else does too? Well, Foursquare does. Google Latitude does. Facebook Places. They all know so much about you. Now, why is it that the people that we know least about know the most about us? Shouldn't we have this data? Shouldn't we be able to leverage and use all of our behavior and our shopping and our check-in experiences. Well, frequently when I say this, people are like, oh, that's, that's too much information. I'm a busy person. I do a lot of things. Maybe I look at Mint to see my credit card transactions, but I don't have time to slice and dice all of my data. Well, yeah. I, I then say, well, we've augmented the physical world with all of these virtual artifacts. Location is now the proxy that we experience reality. We've got to take advantage of this information. We've got to make it work for us. Now, there's a great analogy that, about big data that I really like. And, and with this slide, I'm trying to say there's a lot of data. It's all connected to our devices. Um, but now, big data is frequently like a puzzle. That's not what I'm going to do. There, here we go. So <laughs> I'll explain that slide later. Um, 
So big data is like a puzzle where if you have a few pieces of information, a few um, bits of this puzzle, maybe you make the border and you don't really know where, where you're going. You don't really see the bigger picture because you only have a little bit of information. Whereas the more data that you get, you can fill in this puzzle and suddenly you have a better picture. You, you, it paints, you, you understand where you're going. You have, you have this complete understanding of all of the information you have and how it flows together. Um, you know, we need to, wouldn't it be great if you went into a really crowded store and, and somehow you could look at your, your buying history and, and you wouldn't have to fight the crowds and you could understand what products in there would be, would really appeal to you and, and would be something that would, that would really stand out, that would, that would make your life better. How do we, the, the question is how do we use this data to make our lives better? So um, now I'm, I'm going to bring it back to Watson. So this, this is my thought, it's a little bit far out, but now, if we had access to all of our, all of the, the, the Amazon um, buying histories and all of the check-ins and all of the places that our phone went and where we scanned our coupons and our physical coupons and our Groupons, and if we had all of this data together, um, what if we could you know, turn in an AI system such as Watson that uses machine learning and information management and information retrieval, what if, what if we took a system like that and set it loose on our personal data. Um, and the thought being here that past buying history is a really good indicator of future buying history. So I have to go to the grocery store tonight, and, and that's uh, actually a true story. And I hate going to the grocery store because I make a list, and I never put everything I need on the list, and then I get to the grocery store, and I inevitably forget to buy something. And this happens every single week, and it frustrates me to no eternity, and I, I don't have a better system. But you know, when I go to Safeway, I have an itemized list. They know what I'm buying. So what if we could mitigate these problems by using a system like Watson that would help tell us, all right, Julia, this week you need to eat more leafy greens. Um, you need to buy these items. Oh, last time you were in this store, remember that sweater you got? Yeah, you never wore that, so maybe you shouldn't buy another one. Or even better, there's a Groupon, today's Groupon, that's something you might actually use, but you know, since you, you bought that other Groupon a few months ago, you never used it, so when you see this type of thing, maybe you shouldn't buy it. You know, why don't we use this data to make our lives really easier and better? So, thank you so much. Um, have a good, thanks for listening, and that's...